Aloha and welcome to our video on understanding air pressure. In this video we'll describe how air pressure exerted on objects, we'll explain how changes in air pressure affect the mercury column of a barometer, and finally we'll identify factors that affect wind. Okay, so earlier in another video we talked a little bit about air pressure and we kind of saw a drawing that looked a little bit like this one over here. What I wanted to show you is you can see how, remember, most of the air is down at the lower part of the atmosphere, so we can see an awful lot more of the air molecules there than we see up here. Because there's more down here, we're going to have more pressure, obviously. Here we have lower because there's less of that column that's still weighing upon them. If we look here, we'll look at somebody at sea level here, and our individual at sea level is being pushed on by this entire column of air that's pushing down, but it's pushing in all directions upon him. So you can see how he's experiencing more pressure than our individual here at the top of the mountain who has only this small little column of air pushing down, and there's less molecules adding that pressure to him. So we do notice a difference in pressure from sea level as we travel up through the atmosphere. And it's gonna be more pronounced initially in the lower level, lower altitudes, because we have this higher amount down here. So we'll see a larger variation quickly as opposed to when we get up higher here where we get a smaller variation change. Okay, so how do we measure air pressure? We use a tool called a barometer. And on this page, we can see two different kinds. The first one is a mercury barometer. And under high pressure, we're gonna have a lot of pressure coming down. It's gonna force this mercury in the pool here to go down. So its only escape will be to go up the tube here and we can measure our high pressure here. If we have low pressure, there's going to be less forcing here, which is going to cause the mercury in the tube to come out and fill in the pond. We'll see the pond level rise a little bit, and then we'll get a lower pressure value there. So our mercury barometer gives us an instantaneous what's our pressure there. The aneroid barometer that we see here, because it has a rotating cylinder, this is going to be turning, and as it does so, it'll record what the changes are in pressure over time. So we can kind of get a picture that way. The way that this one works is we have this chamber of air, and as it's increase in pressure, this chamber gets smaller. As it gets smaller through a series of pulleys and levers, it'll cause the pen here to rise up for high pressure and then to drop back down for low pressure. So one of the interesting things, and we'll learn about pressure here a little bit further as we're talking about different types of air masses, but we'll see that we have our weather maps. And on our weather maps, we have these lines, which we call isobars. Remember, iso is same, and then bar would refer to a millibar, how we measure pressure. So each of these lines are going to be pressure lines. So we can see what the air pressure is and where it is. So here we have a high pressure system here, where we can see represented by this H, and we'll have a low pressure system right in through here as well. And we'll talk more about these pressure systems and how they affect our weather in the next couple of slides and videos. Now, in a future video, we're gonna talk about how winds are formed. And basically what we need to know is that we have areas of high pressure, which means we have a lot of air here. So high pressure has a lot of air. And then we have our areas of low pressure where we have a little bit less air in those areas. And what we're going to notice is that the air from a high pressure is going to want to move to a low pressure. And that's how we make wind. And we'll cover this a little bit more detail in our next videos. One of the things, if you remember back to currents, we talked about was this Coriolis effect. And we talked about how the Earth is spinning. And because the Earth spins in this direction, if we have a movement of something not attached, like current was water not attached to the surface, or wind, which is the atmosphere which isn't attached to it, then we have this bending effect going on, which we call the Coriolis effect. So in the Northern Hemisphere, if you can recall, it's going to travel and bend a little bit to the right caused by the rotation of the Earth. So we can see if we had a wind that was blowing from the North Pole to the equator, it would bend a little bit to the right and we'd see that aspect change there. And it's just the opposite if we go down to the Southern Hemisphere where it will bend to the left. And we can see if we had a wind blowing up from the South, it would do that. So this is how we get a change in the winds, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later on. I just wanted to remind you of the Coriolis effect. So that's it for our video. As always, good luck on the quiz, and we'll see you in the next video. Aloha, and welcome to our video on pressure centers and winds. As promised, in this video, we'll talk about how high and low pressures create winds. Um, in here, we will describe what air pressure patterns are within cyclones and anticyclones, and explain how unequal heating of the Earth's surface affects the atmosphere.
Okay, let's take a look at this picture showing us cyclonic and anticyclonic winds. Um, first and foremost, we want to refer to anticyclonic is always going to be referred to as a high pressure system, and a cyclonic is always going to be a low pressure system. So our storms, our tropical cyclones and things of that nature generally form in low pressure systems. So that's why we're going to call it a cyclonic system here. And our highs are the opposite, so it's going to be the anticyclonic condition. Now on our map here, you can see that we have all of these different lines. These are our isobars. These are showing us areas where pressure is going to be the same. And notice that my pressure is going to decrease to the low and then it will increase back up to the high. So we can see 116 going down here to a low and then we can see an increase of it coming back up here to the high. So what we'll notice is that winds are going to traditionally blow from the high pressure system to a low pressure system. And the reason why is if we look at what's going on in these environments. So let's start with a cyclone, a low pressure system. Because we have a low pressure system, remember this is where we're going to see rising air. So it's going to be a little bit warmer probably. And that rising air, as the air rises up here, is going to create a gap down below. And that gap to the low is going to be filled up by the surrounding air blowing in. So that's where we see this cyclonic flow going on here, where we're going to have this air all blowing in towards the middle of a low pressure. But because it's slightly warmer, it's going to rise up. And then above, we have this divergence above. Okay, so the air is going to flow in along the ground, go up, and then it's going to be spread out. And here's our low pressure system. Okay, and that's our cyclonic flow. So we can see the wind blowing in towards the lows. Okay, so that helps us predict air direction. Now, in an anticyclonic or a high pressure system, we notice that the pressure, the air, is coming in from the high. So it's blowing in high, it's all converging into this area, which is going to force a downdraft of the air. Now remember, when air lifted up, it got cooler and we formed clouds. As air comes down, we're going to see a dissipation of the clouds. So normally in a high pressure system, we're going to have clear skies. In a low pressure system, we're going to have the clouds, and that's where we're going to get our rain. So high pressure is normally clear weather. Low pressure is going to be cloudy weather. Now, as this air is converging here, it's going to get to the ground, and it's going to dissipate out from there. So if I have a high and a low nearby, you can see that my air and we'll do it in blue here, is going to blow into the high area, which is going to cause it to come down. It's going to be a little cooler. When it hits the ground, it's going to blow over to a low system where we're going to experience this updraft, and then we'll have that air transfer, and we can see these cycles. But on the surface, where we are, is where we'll experience this wind blowing from the high to the low. And that's how we get wind patterns for the most part. Now, highs and lows are going to be regional. What we want to look at is what happens worldwide. And if we take our example here, and our key here is it's a non-rotating Earth. So if the Earth wasn't rotating, if it was just sitting there, we would get more energy, more heat coming to the equator, so it would be hot, which is what we see. So now as we heat up that air, it's going to cause that air to rise, which is what it'll do to the end of the atmosphere. And then once it gets there, it's going to bend either north or south. As it travels in the atmosphere, it's going to cool off until it gets to the poles where it'll all converge there. And then at that point, it will plummet down to the surface and then it'll spread out and come to the surface, blow down over towards the equator where it'll heat back up and we get that whole cycle continuing again. And we can see that in our little cycle diagrams over here where you have the heating of the air here causing it to over here we have heating. And that's going to cause this air to rise. As it rises, it's going to spread out and cool off in the atmosphere until it gets so cold it'll plummet down. When it plummets down, it spreads out and it's going to travel over the earth. It's going to warm up, warm up, warm up, finally get warm enough that they're lifting. And that's how we can see this cycle continuing here. Okay, but as you know, the earth does rotate. And because it rotates, one of the side effects is going to be this Coriolis effect. So what we'll notice is we have here at the equator, we have an area called the doldrums. And the reason it's called the doldrums is because there's not a lot of wind going on there. What's happening is, is we're warming it up, and at the doldrums, the wind would basically be blowing upwards. So there's not a lot of wind there. Now, 
as it's going and as it's blowing across, the earth is going to turn. It's going to cause it to bend this way. And as it bends this way, it's going to heat up and rise. So our air is rising up here at the equator. It's going to hit the upper level of the atmosphere, cool, and it's going to dissipate and spread out. So we can see it rising up here, and then it's going to spread out this way. As it does so, it's going to get cold, and as it gets cold, it's going to drop down. And we notice that this happens at about what we call the horse latitudes at about 30 degrees north. At 30 degrees north, it's cooled off enough, it's going to start dropping down. And then when it hits the earth, it's going to go one of two ways. It can either go south, or it can travel north. Under both of those circumstances, it's going to heat up again. And as it heats up, eventually it'll rise back up. So we can have this one, this Hadley cell here at the tropics where we're seeing how at the equator it's going up, it's going to travel up to a higher, about 30 degrees latitude, where it'll plummet back down and then it'll run along the surface and create this cell. In this area on the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, we call these the trade winds. Now they were called the trade winds because we could send the boats to the west using these trade winds and that's kind of our direction and that's why they were named that. Now if we go above we have this other area here where it plummets down at the horse latitudes and it can warm up as it's traveling north and it'll rise back up. And as it rise back up we can get this cell going on here where we see the same thing. It'll go and warm up, it's going to come here, travel to here and it'll come back down. Now here as the wind is blowing north across the surface, it's going to bend a little bit to the right, like we said the Coriolis will do, and that's how we end up with our westerly winds. And if you notice, here's the United States. We're going to have most of our weather in the United States because of these westerlies will travel from the west to the east. So if you watch storms move, they'll go from west to east. Now we have a little bit of rising here going on as it does so. It'll either travel back this way to the horse latitudes or it's going to travel up to the pole. It'll cool. As it comes down, it'll blow from the pole along the surface. That's going to make it turn into our polar easterlies. So you can see how we have polar easterlies, then we have our westerlies, and then we will have our trade winds. And the exact same thing happens on the southern hemisphere as well. So these are how we get our global wind patterns. So if I was sailing and I wanted to go from east to west, I might head down south and sail in the tropics that way. But if I wanted to go from the west to the east, I might sail up a little bit more into my mid-latitudes and that would carry me across that way using the general winds. And our airplanes will do the same thing. So putting it all together, we can have our map here. And what our map is going to show me is we'll have regions of highs and regions of lows. Over here, we have a high pressure system. You can see it there. We'll have another high pressure system here, and then we'll have our low pressure system over here. Okay, so we have our lows and our highs. And remember, the wind's going to blow in the general direction from the high to the low, from our high to our low. So that's how we're going to get wind patterns going on. So this will give us a kind of a global circulation for July, how it works out. Okay, so that's it for our video. As always, good luck on your quiz, and we'll see you in the next video. Aloha and welcome to our video on regional wind systems. In this video, we'll identify the cause of local winds. We'll describe the general movement of weather in the United States. We'll compare and contrast weather patterns characteristic of El Nino and La Nina events. And we'll describe how global winds and pressure systems affect precipitation. Okay, so let's take a look at our first local wind pattern. Remember one thing about winds that's kind of interesting is we name them from the direction from which they blow. So when we have a land breeze, what we're talking about is wind that is coming from the land out to the ocean. So that's why we call it land breeze, because it's coming from the land. Okay. Now conversely, if we have a sea breeze, we're going to have what? The wind will blow from the sea into the land, so it's called a sea breeze. Remember, we name winds from where they come from. So now let's take a look at how this works. So we'll start with a sea breeze. In a sea breeze, what's going to happen is we will have heating of land, which is going to get hotter faster. So as the heat land heats up, it's going to warm the air above it, and we're going to get this warm air rising. And as that warm air rises, it's going to create a little bit of a vacuum effect here, which is going to pull air into that vacuum to fill that space where we're rising that air. Now as the air rises, it's going to get up so high, and then it'll start to spread out. And as it spreads out, it'll cool, and as it cools and becomes more dense, 
it'll fall back down to where the ocean is, where it's cooler, and then it'll hit there and spread. And because we have this circulation starting, we end up with this cycle going here as well. So we'll see this cycle that's going to repeat this way. Okay, so we'll have air heated over the land, causing it to rise, hitting into the atmosphere, cooling, plummeting down over the ocean, and then where surface breeze, the part that we're worried about, is this one right here. And this is how we get a sea breeze. Okay, so this will happen generally in the daytime. Um, normally, it's going to peak in the afternoons, okay, is where we'll have a stronger sea breeze blowing in. Now, the opposite happens at night. At nighttime, the air water temperature is going to be about the same. So air is going to feel a little warmer above the water. So it's going to be warm there, and that's where we're going to see our rising. Okay, it's going to spread out that way. It'll cool off. Now, because the land is cooler, it'll cool the air above it, which will then allow this air to blow down. And as it comes down and spreads out there, it's going to fill this gap here. and We're going to get this air blowing from the land to the ocean and our land breeze going on. So here we'll see another cycle, but this time our cycle is going the opposite direction. Okay, and that's what creates a land breeze as opposed to a sea breeze. Okay, so we can see the same type of a local wind pattern here with mountains and valleys. We have a valley breeze, which means the wind is going to blow from the valley upwards up the mountain, or we can have a mountain breeze where it will blow down the mountain from the mountain to the valleys there. And we can see the same type of thing happening. In the daytime, what's going to happen? We're going to have this warming this area down here in the valley it's going to warm the, as the air rises it's going to rise upwards along the mountains to clean out the valley way there we're basically heating up the air it's going to spread out a little bit and as it's spread out it's going to cause that air to rise out of the valley as nighttime comes in it's going to cause that air to cool and as it cools it's going to pull that air back in so that's how we make a valley breeze and our mountain breezes now, as we're talking about winds, we can talk about winds having two different properties that we worry about. One of them is the direction, okay? And we will measure the direction by using a little fin system here that you can see. But the wind direction is important. And remember, we name a wind by where it comes from. So if we have a westerly wind, that means it's blowing from the west to the east, okay? So remember that wind direction tells us where it's blowing from. We can also measure the wind speed, how fast is the wind moving. So when we report winds, we like to give it by direction and by speed. And that gives us a clear picture of what the winds are. Okay, now you'll hear about El Nino and La Nina. Um, El Nino is really an interesting event. It's one that we really appreciate here in the southwest because that's when we expect a lot of precipitation in the wintertime. Um, the normal condition is shown up above, and that's kind of what a La Nina event would be as well. And here, what we want to talk about is we want to talk about how we're having a warm water, low pressure system over here in Southeast Asia. And that's going to cause our cooler water that's here with the strong Peruvian current. We're going to get strong equatorial currents and strong winds blowing this way. So when we form our storms here, and because there's such a big difference, we're going to get a lot of hurricanes that are going to form this way and they're going to move in this direction. So the moisture that we're forming these storms with is going to move out this way. During El Nino, what happens is we build up so much warm water that it flows back. So as it flows back, it causes that countercurrent, which means we stay warm here, which means now what's happening is we don't get a lot of this wind and currents moving everything out. So the moisture and the storms that are forming here Instead of them going this way, they generally tend to go up this way, and we tend to get a lot more moisture, okay? So when we have our normal conditions here, we generally have a colder winter. If we have uh, these environments, it's going to be a slightly warmer winter, but we'll get a lot more precipitation, and that's going to be kind of good for the southwest where we've been having a drought. Okay, really quickly, let's talk about global precipitation real quick. What we notice is we're going to have our areas here where we have moist, warm, moist air, which is going to normally travel this way. So if we're taking this moist air coming this way, it's going to collide with this air coming in this way. And that's why we see a lot more moisture in these regions than we do over here and over in the desert regions over here. 
So by knowing how the winds move globally, we can predict a little bit about precipitation, but for the most part, we look for immediate precipitation in the form of weather and storms. Okay, so that's it for our video. As always, good luck on your quiz, and we'll see you in the next video.